Magna here and a warm hello to my Bransgore brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, we've certainly been living through some very strange times recently, being confined to meeting each other electronically. But God willing, those times are coming to an end and I'm certainly looking forward to meeting each other face to face so that we can have the warm community that we once had. God bless you all and see you soon. Hi everyone, Brian and Angela Edgley here from Sunny Christchurch. Thought we'd pop along and say hello. Hello! <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, thank you for everybody who's been involved in the services online. They've been brilliant. And uh, just want to thank you all and say well done. And uh, thank you to all those who have been supporting us in prayer this challenging year. Thank you very much. We're it's been a very uh, challenging year. As the Beatles once wrote uh, about a long and winding road, I'm sure we'll look back one day and we'll have many stories to tell our grandchildren. Looking forward to seeing you all soon. So bye for now. Bye. bye. Hello, brothers and sisters from Bransgore. Hello from Timisoara, Romania. I, I'm Mile Damian. I visited Bransgore for three times, 91, 92, and last time in 2000, I guess. We have learned many things from you, but from the work you have done in Romania, and in Rusova in particular, we've learned your love, we've learned your perseverance in doing the Lord's work, and we have learned your vision and that vision has helped even me to get farther in Serbia, in Grebenac, 
and in other places. Praise to God. In fact, Jesus went through the villages of Galilee saying, I must do what the Lord sent me to do. And now I want for you, for you the verse from Ruth 2.12. May the Lord bless you and reward you for what you have done. And let's remain together, faithful under his wings. Amen. Guys! Hello! Hello, hello. Uh, this is a bit of a sad wave. Oh, um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, actually waving to say a tem temporary goodbye. Yeah, only a short goodbye. Short goodbye, like a couple of months. Be back in September, but we have come to the end of our first year, first year at Moreland's. Which is great. We say it like it's been really depressing, it's actually been fantastic. Uh, yeah, so, it's been awesome to meet you all. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll be back in September, but thank you for, for having us. Yeah, for letting us, uh, us in. Yeah. Letting us into your, yeah. humble, your humble church. community. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really looking forward to next term, uh, yeah, to really. We, well, can I can actually say I'm looking forward to the summer for, for the camp that we're going on. Mm. I, I'm very pumped for that, but I'm looking forward to moving from that uh, and really investing into the young people and seeing where we go from there about the armour of God and equipping us for maybe more outreach. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, say that. Probably. Sneak peek. Awesome. Emily. Yeah, I just want to say a massive thank you to everybody that I've met so far, and I'm so excited to meet more of you and to get to know more of the church. Um, but it's just been awesome just to get, get to know you all and how welcoming you've all been. It really feels like I'm at home in this church and I can't wait to see what God's got in store for the next two years. Can yeah. we also just add it's extremely hot up here. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's like so about much. 35 degrees yeah. up here. So if you think, wow, <laughs> Joe looks rough, blame Andy, the heating guy. Love you guys. Yeah. See you later. See you soon. <laughs>
Testament from John chapter 8 48 to 59 it's called Jesus claims about himself the Jews answered him aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon possessed I am not possessed by a, Je a demon said Jesus but I honor my father and you dishonor, dishonor me I am not seeking glory for myself but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge very truly I tell you Whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never see, taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father who you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I did not, not, I would be a liar like you. But I know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones and, sto and to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Have you ever been shocked by what someone has said? Whether it's a friend or something you've seen on Facebook or Twitter or the news? we would daily be faced with and unfortunately often become used to shocking statements. That day though, when Jesus was talking with the Jewish people who had already been reacting to many things Jesus had said and done, on this occasion, it was rather shocking. Previously, and, and even in this chapter here, we see that the people were questioning who Jesus was. They called Jesus a demon-possessed Samaritan. They considered Samaritans as unclean heretics. So they considered him a false teacher who was trying to lead people astray. Hence why they called him demon-possessed. But it was this time in what Jesus said that was so shocking it caused them to turn on him violently, picking up rocks, wanting to stone him and now kill him. 
What was it that caused such a reaction? Well, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. Honestly, what's so shocking about that? The claim that he was before Abraham, well, yes, this man before them is claiming he was, what, alive multiple generations ago, centuries before Abraham was alive. Well, yes, I guess that would have been shocking, but that alone, would it have caused them to want to kill him? It was, in fact, Jesus' use of those two words, I am, that caused such a shocking response from the crowd. But why? Well, I am was a term they understood from the scriptures, from the Torah. And to understand it better, let's dive into the Old Testament to a guy called Moses, a Hebrew man who had been adopted into the royal Egyptian family. His own adopted family were responsible for the slavery and ill treatment of many Hebrew men and women. And we're going to pick up our story after Moses had to flee Egypt after the killing of an Egyptian and is wandering the wilderness when something catches his eye. Let's take a look at this. Here I am. Take the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you stand is holy ground. You were born of my mother, you heaven. You are our brother. Who are you? I am that I am. I don't understand. I am the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What do you want with me? I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their cry. Stop it! Leave that man alone! So I have come down to deliver them out of slavery and bring them to a good land. And so, unto Pharaoh, I shall send you. Me? Who am I to lead these people? They'll never believe me. They won't even listen. I shall teach you what to say. Let my people go! But I was their enemy. I was the prince of Egypt, the son of the man who slaughtered their children. You've... You've chosen the wrong messenger. How, how can I even speak to these people? Who made man's mouth? Who made the deaf, the mute, the seeing, or the blind? Did not I? Now go! notice in the clip when Moses asked the voice, who are you? The response was, I am that I am. And Moses fell to the ground. The name I am or Yahweh was 
considered a very special name, a holy, perfect name for God. This I am is God. And this use of the term I am is referencing that God's existence is not dependent upon anyone else. His plans are not dependent upon any circumstances. God is over all things, has always been and will always be for all eternity. And here, the I am promises that he will be what he will be. That is, he will be the eternally constant God. He stands ever present and unchangeable, completely sufficient in himself to do what he wills to do and to accomplish what he wills to accomplish. And his will was to use Moses to set his people free, the Israelites, free from slavery in Egypt. And do you know what, what happened? Well, what happened was exactly that. God used Moses to set his people free. Did you also notice in that clip what the voice said to Moses? He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And shortly, Alison will tell us a little bit about these individuals and how the great I am helped his people. How God showed his faithfulness, his power, his grace to this people. ever made you a promise? Did they keep it? Did you expect that they would? It probably depends on who it was. If it was a politician or maybe a casual acquaintance or possibly an eBay or Amazon seller, maybe your hopes weren't high. 
but if it was someone you trusted and knew well, probably you were expecting them to keep their promise. Things you might have thought about were, have they kept previous promises? Have they got your best interests at heart? Have you seen evidence of promises that they've kept to others? The Jewish people in the time when Jesus lived on earth, they often spoke about the promises of God and they prided themselves on belonging to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The Bible tells us of Abram receiving a promise from God that he would become the father of many nations. But he and his wife were old and childless, so it seemed an unlikely promise because they were certainly too old to have children naturally. God had been faithful before though, so Abram at first tried to wait patiently. God had been faithful to him in the past and he trusted that he would be faithful to him now. God even gave him a new name, Abraham, meaning father of many. Names were important in biblical times. People chose them with care to mean something to them or to tell something to others. And God giving you a name himself was particularly special. Abraham and his wife got tired of waiting for God to start fulfilling his promise and they tried to move things along themselves by Abraham having a son with a servant and this caused a lot of problems later. Even though they weren't faithful to him, God was faithful to them. God didn't give up on them and eventually their son Isaac was born more than 20 years after the promise was given. Isaac must have known he was very special growing up as he would have been taught that through him all these descendants would come. I'm sure that Abraham told him about God's promise and just who he was in God's plan. Imagine his shock then when his own beloved father Abraham was about to sacrifice him before God stepped in and stopped it. I wonder what effect that had on him and his trust in his father and his trust in God. We're not actually told in the Bible how he felt about the experience. But at this time, God not only promised Abraham a great number of descendants, but he promised that through him, all nations would be blessed. Was that a hint of the future when more than the Jewish nation could eventually come to God? We know that God kept his promise and Isaac also married and had sons. But again, there was quite a time to wait and he had to keep trusting in God. How often, I wonder, did he call on the name of God in prayer as he waited 20 years for his twins to be conceived and born? He knew God had great plans for the family. Did he have any idea just what God's full plan was to eventually bring about his plan for salvation through sending his own son to be born from their family line? I doubt it but he knew who he believed in, the God of his father, the God who had always been faithful. Even though Isaac also sometimes failed him, God repeated the promise to Isaac that he had made to Abraham. Isaac's twins had some serious issues with sibling rivalry, not helped by their mum and dad each having a favourite son. Jacob is the twin who ended up inheriting his father's birthright despite being the younger twin. He tricked his father and his brother with the help of his mother. We can see that like his father and grandfather, Jacob didn't always get things right. He certainly let God down on several occasions, but God never let him down. The promise given first to Abraham was passed down through Isaac and on to Jacob, who was used by God despite his flaws. God also gave him a new name of Israel and he ended up continuing the family line that led to the founding of the 12 tribes of Israel and also eventually to Jesus' family line. Jesus came to be born in Bethlehem as the place declared as the home of his family line and this was his human line. Joseph, who was entrusted to raise him with Mary, was told to name him Jesus but his name already existed in the heavenly realm before the world was formed. Jesus was fully God and he was there at the dawn of creation before Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, even before Adam. 
Jesus, the name above all names, and before whom every knee will one day bow. Jesus, come to us in human flesh to live, die and rise again, so that not just one family or one nation could know God, but that all could come to know him and trust in his wonderful name. Thank you, God. So wonderful is your unfailing love. You cross the spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful. So we've come to see I am is a special name for God, the perfect, holy, all-powerful, faithful, loving and gracious God. It was a name so special in fact that anyone who read out the scriptures at that day would not say the I am name, Yahweh, out loud. Because they knew it was so holy, instead what they would do is bow their heads and say, Lord. And so now we understand why when Jesus said before Abraham was born, I am, there was such a violent response. How could someone use this holy name out loud and be claiming to be God? Was Jesus really saying he is this God, this God who freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt? 
Was he saying he's the God who promised a miracle child to Abraham and Sarah and a promise of land to his chosen people? Was he saying that he was the God who promised Abraham too many descendants than he could count, more than the stars in the sky or grains of sands on the earth? Was he saying he's the God who fulfilled his promise to Abraham when he gave birth to a miracle child, Isaac, and then Isaac gave birth to a son, Jacob? The interesting thing is when we continue to read on from Jacob, and we see that Jacob had a son, and that they had a son, and then another son, and another son, and another son, we eventually come to Jesus. Yes, Jesus was saying he is God, and that he had come not to just rescue a nation from slavery in Egypt, but to save all humanity from slavery to sin and death, and to give them life. Jesus was saying he is God and hadn't come to lead a chosen people into a promised land, but to lead the way for all who would put their trust in him into his promised eternal kingdom. In God coming down to us, Jesus was the one who fulfilled the promise given to Abraham in that all those who would see Jesus as the great I am and put their trust in him for the forgiveness of their sins, the one who brings life, that they would become part of his family. And that family will be more than the stars in the sky and grains of sand on the earth. Jesus is the great I am. But unfortunately, at that time, the Jewish people could not see it. They thought he was lying. And therefore saying I am was a terrible crime for which they wanted to kill him. And several chapters later in John's Gospel, that's exactly what will happen. But Jesus would go willingly to the cross, for that was the way he would destroy the sting of sin, which is death, and bring you and I and the whole world freedom and life. This morning we've seen the faithfulness, the grace, the love of God, not to adjust a chosen people, but to all humanity. The great I am willing to come down to this world, to rescue us, to redeem us, to set us free and to say, will you put your trust in me? Will you follow me and let me give you life? Will you look to Jesus this morning as the great I am? Will you put your trust in him? Will you follow him? Know his love, his grace, his faithfulness towards you. Will you say yes to the one who promises to be with you to the very end of the age, the one who gives life, the one who is unchanging, all-powerful, the one before Abraham was born, is, I am. Good morning. morning. Let us pray. In the beginning was God. You are the Ancient of Days, Lord. We praise and worship you this morning, Lord God, holy, righteous God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When we consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have set in place. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, you created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, more wonderful, complex and intricate than we can possibly understand or imagine. We are your people. We worship you. You are a mighty, awesome God, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, God of Gods, the great I am. Your thoughts are greater than our thoughts and your ways are greater than our ways. We thank you that you are our Father. You are Abba. You have engraved us on the palm of your hands. Thank you that you have promised never to leave us or forsake us. We praise you, Lord. You alone are exalted. Your splendour is above all things. You are our rock and our fortress, our refuge and our strength. We glorify your name together. You are great and worthy of praise. We put our trust in you. You are the God of love, 
far above all other gods. Great is your name and most worthy of praise. Your unfailing love endures forever. O Lord, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Let us praise the Lord and forget not all his benefits, who forgives our sins. Lord, you sent us your Son Jesus to be our Shepherd and Saviour and to die for our sins. Such love. We lift our eyes to you, whose throne is in the heavens. We praise you, Lord. We praise you in your sanctuary and in the mighty heavens. We praise you for your acts of power and for your surpassing greatness. Lord, let everything that has breath praise you. Amen. <coughs>that brings us to the end of our time together today and I trust that God has indeed spoken to you and that you have been blessed by the time that you've shared with us. If you've been challenged by anything or you just feel that it would be good to talk to somebody do please get in touch with the church and there will be somebody waiting to talk to you. 
If you'd like to have a virtual coffee and chat with us now, if you're watching this live, then do just press the connect button. And a few of us would love to say hi to you. And um, so now as we prepare to go out into whatever the rest of the week brings, let's just commit ourselves again to God in prayer. Father God, thank you that you have been with us. Thank you that you have given us this opportunity to share with one another. Thank you that your word teaches us so much about you. But Father, we just pray now as we go out into this week and we go back into our normal lives that you would continue to speak to us. Father, we thank you that you can speak to us wherever we are. We don't need to be in a formal service. You can speak to us in many surprising ways. So Father, I just pray that that is what we would experience in this coming week. And Father, I pray that we would each be shown an opportunity to be a blessing to someone else and to share your love as we go out into whatever this week brings. So thank you, Father, that you go before us, that you guide us and you lead us, and that we can continue to trust in you, our ever faithful God. Amen.